Good morning. Praise the Lord that you are here participating with us in live streaming worship service at John R. Bible Church. Please join us in preparing our hearts by singing praises to our God together.
As we continue to worship, keep the guideline of distancing, we're glad that you are here worshiping with us at Jaira. Praise to the faithful God whom we serve. Let us bow for prayer to our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father, we give you praise and worship with our brothers and sisters because you alone are worthy. We praise you for your unfathomable attributes of all presence, all wisdom, and all power. We are grateful that you have chosen to love us and have prepared a perfect and complete plan of redemption through our Lord Jesus Christ to make us acceptable to approach you in your holy presence today. We thank you that you have called us out of our own selves to become members of the body of Christ, that we may be a part of your design, even to learn to love and care for one another and to witness in unity the grace of God to those people who have not yet known Jesus 
as their Savior. On this Memorial Day, Father, we remember all of those who have made their great sacrifices in order to secure the freedom that we enjoy in this land. We remember also the first responders who have dedicated to serve us during this time of pandemic. Above all, Father, we want to thank you for giving us the privilege, privilege to live in this land where we can enjoy the bounty and also the freedom of worship. In this time of social separation, although the secular world does not think that Christian gathering and worship is essential, but we know better. May you teach us that we as followers of Jesus Christ, that we cannot live in isolation and that we must make our corporate gathering and corporate prayer the ultimate and utmost priority in our lives. To that end, Father, we pray for your wisdom so that we can maintain a healthy balance of prudent distancing worship through the avenues such as the live stream, and also at the same time, a deep faith for in your protection. We ask for only Father, that you will hasten the day when we can gather together to see each other face to face again, so we can worship you and encourage and also connect with each other. And Father, we especially uh, uh, pray for the resumption the time of resumption, uh, the important task of nurturing our children with your word and also deepening their foundation of their faith. Father, we also pray for your tender touch and the presence in those lives and people who have been laid off because of the virus pandemic and those people who are being laden and stretched even beyond their capability in their work at home. Father, may you grant faith and peace to assure them of your love and also provision. Father, we thank you for the young people among us. We ask, Father, for your special grace to our graduates, Carissa and also Saul. Protect them from the harm of the secular influence and guide them to walk in your ways the rest of their lives and experience your presence in your faithfulness. As we are about to hear the word with us, and may you grant us hearts of obedience to what you have to say. And we pray and ask in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Alan Wolf, he who is a social, uh, social uh, socialist, soci uh, uh, sociologist, rather, excuse me, he himself is not a Christian, but he is an agnostic. In other words, he does not believe or to know that there is a God or whether who that God might be. Nevertheless, he spent years studying the beliefs of evangelical churches and by visiting many churches across the country, across America. So finally, he wrote a book. It's titled The Transformation of American Religion. In his study, he found this. He said, while evangelicals claim to believe in the absolute truth and the authority of the Bible, which governs all of our lives. However, the evangelicals don't live like that they say they believe. Instead, they use the Bible as a pretext to satisfy their personal and emotional needs. They claim that the worship oh, an awesome God, but their God is merely one who gives them upbeat daily therapy. Christians are no more holy or righteous than the rest of the people. Talk of the talk of hell and sin has been replaced 
by a non-judgmental language of understanding and forgiveness. Evangelicals and evangelicalism, we have copied the culture and also the popular music that it loses so much so that we lose the religious distinctiveness that we once hold. In every aspect, when the American culture and evangel evangelical faith clashes, you know what? The American culture always triumphed over our faith. Now, of course, Mr. Wolf did not visit every church in America, but you know, there is one who has, who has done so. And in fact, he knows everything about every church. I'm afraid the Lord Jesus Christ would have agreed with Alan Wolf that there is a massive credibility gap for today's professing Christians and that there are few churches today that will be counterculture to the society. Now, in the second major division of the book of Revelation, the apostle John, he was told to write seven letters from Jesus Christ to the seven churches in Asia Minor uh, in, uh, at, at the time. These were selected as typical churches in John's day. The seven churches recorded the evaluation uh, uh, that Jesus Christ uh, gave to them. And each of these local churches, actually they have some unique, uh, can be uniquely uh, uh, identified by a prominent situation. When you, however, put them all together, the Re book of Revelation actually constitutes the sum total of the characteristics of all of the churches and has a broader application for all of the churches in the present church age. Now, in previous messages, we looked at the book of Revelation chapter 2, where Jesus wrote to the churches at Ephesus, Smyrna, and also Pergamum. We find that the church at Ephesus, Jesus said, it is a very active church. They are orthodox in their doctrines and practice. However, there's one element that's missing. And that missing element is the most important one, which is they have lost their first love for Jesus Christ. Now, on the other hand, the church at Smyrna, it was a church that has gone through tremendous suffering. Yet, yet they, because of their faithfulness and also their love for, for Christ, Jesus Christ commended the church for her richness in him. Then we have the church at Pergamum. It was reprimanded by, the church was reprimanded by Jesus Christ for their compromise stand. And it starts out with the infiltration of erroneous teachings. Then it mutates into the tolerance for sin. And then finally it spreads out into a deadly growth that paralyzes the testimony of the church. Now remember, one consequence of compromise is that when you compromise your personal integrity, your moral values, or your uh, uh, scriptural teaching, it never stops there. It will also uh, continue to move further and deeper until it had, leads to something that's very, very costly for the church at the end. Now today, we're going to be looking at the next four letters written to the churches at Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And we will know that, note that these four churches were called out, respectively, for their stigma and also the character of doctrinal deviation, spiritual deadness. And However, there is also some that was uh, 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 commended by Jesus Christ for their evangelistic favor. And then finally, there's also the tragedy of worldliness. In the fourth letter, Jesus Christ addressed to the church at the Thyatira. Jesus described himself in chapter three, verse uh, chapter two, verse thirteen, as the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, 
and whose feet are like banished browns. He acknowledged that the church in Thyatira, even though it, the church has a long list of good uh, quality traits, he said in verse 19, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are, have, have done more, uh, you have now done more than you did at first. A church like that, however, Jesus rebuked them for following false teachings, just like the church at Pergamum, because of the false teaching was not merely infiltrating into the church. It has already taken roots in the church, so much so that the believers at Thyatira has gotten so used to it, they actually uh, tolerated the sin. In chapter 2, verse 20, Jesus said to the church, he said, you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the uh, eating of food sacrificed to idols. You see, apparently there is a self-proclaimed prophetess. She was influencing the church. And the name that Jesus gave to that woman is Jezebel. It kind of suggests that she is corrupting the Thyatira church, much, much like uh, Ahab's wife, uh, Jezebel, corrupted Israel in the Old Testament time. This might be how it goes. Since Thyatira was a commercial center with many trade unions, trade guilds, idolatry and morality, these are very rampant in the city of Thyatira. And those two are the enemies of the church. And these practices were always present when trades were made. Here comes Jezebel, who had this following reasoning. He said, hey, Christian businessman, it's okay to lower your standards. When you participate in the idolaters, uh, to participate in the idolaters feasting, just for the sake of uh, making a trade, doing some business. Unfortunately, these Christians also drifted in the immorality that went with it. In similar ways, the world and culture around us today, it grows more and more immoral, be it homosexual lifestyle, abortion, pornography, or postmodern tolerance. Many believers today become so used to it we are desensitized, and we cannot tell the difference between secular values from the biblical values. When we hear from the false prophets preaching from the pulpit, they fail to take Jesus' warning to examine the fruit of the depraved lifestyle of these false teachers. Many churches today are also conformed to the mold of the world when they don't Com, uh, com, uh, confront immoral lifestyle of members in their midst. Many, many churches fear that if we were to confront them, we may lose some of the members, or we may be accused of being unloving. But you know, the Bible, biblical love never condones wickedness, and the Lord will not tolerate sin in his church, because righteousness is not a matter of balancing the good and the bad. It does not do that. Righteousness is, is, is absolute. When the Lord, what the Lord wants is genuine repentance. And when church refuses to repent, Jesus said, I who search the hearts and also the mind and will judge you with uh, uh, the, the intense suffering. And this is a tremendous warning for the churches, all of the churches. But however, there are some who did not follow this uh, path. Jesus said, those of you who don't hold to her teaching, Jezebel's teaching, and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. Uh, Jesus said, I'm, uh, I want you to know that you will join me one day in the uh, millennial kingdom. You will be administered justice with me together. You see, Satan was also called the bright star. But Satan only brings about 
darkness, and death. Jesus said, you are going to be overcomers. You will be identified with me, rather. And Jesus Christ is the bright and morning star. And Jesus said, you will also receive the title of morning star because you identified with me. As morning star appears just before the dawn, it may refer to the rapture of the church before the dark hours of God's judgment on the world, preceding the dawn of the millennial kingdom. Brothers, sisters, are there areas in your life that you have compromised and conformed to the world pattern? Repent, change your ways, change your mind. He who has a year, let him hear what the Spirit of God says to the churches. Do we hear him? Now the next letter is addressed to the church at Sardis. The city uh, Sardis is, is an ancient city. It was once a very wealthy capital of the kingdom of Lydia. It's set on a hill surrounded by high cliffs, which made the people, the city dwellers, very cocky and very self-confident. However, twice in 549 BC and 214 BC, the inhabitants, while they were sleeping in the night, soundly, the city was overtaken by former, uh, uh, by enemies, by their enemies. At the time when John was writing the letter, Sardis was only a shadow of its former splendor. Now, Jesus Christ described himself as one who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. He knows, he sees everything about the church at Sardis in full. And there were no words of commendation for this church. And um, instead, Jesus rebuked the church at Sardis, Sardis in verses 1 and, and 2. He said that. He said, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Like just like the city, the church at Sardis had grown complacent and they have gone to sleep. They are spiritually sleeping with a dying witness and also a decaying ministry. It is alive in name only. But Jesus said, I'm not going to give you up. There's hope for revival. Just like treating one who arrived at the ER, emergency room, in ambulance. Jesus Christ uh, counseled the church. He said, I will give you five-fold command so that you can be revived. In verses 2 and 3, Jesus said, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, obey it and repent it and repent. If you, however, do not respond, Jesus said, I, I will come like a thief. In other words, it will be sudden. It will be unexpected. Jesus said that you will not know at what time I will come to you. The, to the few in Sardis who have remained true to Jesus Christ, and they have not compromised. Jesus made a promise to them, said, Overcomers, you will be dressed in white, and you will walk with me. And I will acknowledge you, your names before the Father and angels. The message of Sardis is a warning to all of the so-called great churches that are living on past glory. Think about it. Today, there are many churches and denominations that were once uh, coming from the spiritual giants, such as Calvin, Luther, the Wesleyan traditions, etc. They have now turned to li liberalism to the core. When empty ritual and human issues were preached on Sundays, replacing God's life and God's presence, the result is spiritual lifelessness. And the church becomes a spiritual corpse, despite its appearance of vitality. That is what happened as both the city of Sardis and the church ceased to exist 
shortly after the New Testament time. Brothers and sisters, let us examine our lives, both as, in, as individual believers and also as a church. If we find ourselves showing any signs of being infiltrated by the compromise of Pergamon, just remember it will push us to the tolerance of Thyatira. And this will ultimately lead us to the death of Sardis. Let's follow the fivefold command of Jesus Christ that we will wake up, we will strengthen the rest. We will remember what we have been taught and we will obey and we will repent. And let's also renew our vision of, of our calling. And we will apply the faith that will produce life and works. And Jesus concluded with this word, these words. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. May we hear and heed what Jesus is saying as he walks among us today. Now the sixth letter was addressed to the church at Philadelphia. In Revelation 3, verses 7 to 13, we notice that the city of Philadelphia sits on a very strategic fault, geological fault. Hence, the area is prone to earthquakes. It had been destroyed by severe earthquake that happened uh, uh, around 37 AD. It happened frequently, especially right before uh, the, in the same uh, century AD 737 it has a big earthquake yet because it has, has uh, Philadelphia is located in a very strategic location it is a trade route from Rome to the east there's a very beautiful name that was assigned to it it's called the gate to the east as a result the church at Philadelphia they also have tremendous opportunity to make contact with many people who travel through the city. You know what? The church at the Philadelphia took full advantage of this open opportunity for a spiritual goal. The church at Philadelphia and also the persecuted uh, uh, church at Smyrna, these were the only two churches that did not receive rebukes from Jesus Christ as he examined and also uh, uh, appraised the performance of the seven churches. In this letter, Jesus Christ described himself in verse seven as one who is holy and true, and one who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Such description complemented what he found out about the state of the church at Philadelphia. In verse number eight, Jesus Christ praised the church. He said, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my words and have not denied my name. There was a person by the name of Robert Mons. He made a comment that the founder, the person who founded the city of Philadelphia, there's a goal in his mind. He wants to make the city a center of Greece, Asia civilization, Asiatic civilization, and also a means to spread the Greek language and culture. And the mission of the city was to promote unity of spirit and custom and loyalty within its empire. You know what? The founder of the city of Philadelphia succeeded. Now, as Jesus evaluated the deeds of the church at Philadelphia, in spite of the fact that the church was small, Jesus said, you have little strength. Probably it is a reference to the believers uh, uh, there who are few in number. They are probably low in social societal status. Nevertheless, Jesus found that the church had taken the opportunity of the gateway of the East to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. For that reason, Jesus said, I have, I'm going to give you an open door and you are going to be the gatekeeper 
and also the gateway to salvation for many. Note that the church remained faithful to the word. Unlike the churches at Pergamum, Thyatira, or Sardis, the church at Philadelphia did not compromise, did not depart from the truth and the faith, but it had kept Jesus' word and his command to endure patiently. And they stayed true and genuine, just like their master, their Lord, whose name is holy and true. Now, the world may not think much about a, a small church and a lowly church, an unimpressive church like Philadelphia. But you know what? It is not so in Jesus' eyes. In verses 9 to 12, Jesus promised that I'm going to give you three great rewards. First of all, he said, I'm going to be submitting your oppressors and, uh, uh, to, in order that they will fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Secondly, he said, I'm going to be spare you from the, the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those people who live on the earth. And thirdly, Jesus said, I'm going to keep, your, keep you secure and grant you a new name and a new identity. You see, for the city of Philadelphia, it is very earthquake prone. So much so that some of the citizens refused to stay inside the city. And they opted for the surrounding countryside because of the security reasons, concerns. Jesus Christ nevertheless promised uh, the believers in Philadelphia. He said, I'm going to make the overcomers a pillar in the temple of my God, inside the temple, not outside. I'm going to give you names, the, uh, the new names of God and the new Jerusalem and also the uh, Jesus. The new name will be written on you. So the promise of new security, new name, and new identity are not a mere facelift, but it is a permanent seal. Brothers and sisters, do you wish that we could have more people, more resources to do more of God's work here at Jara Bible Church? The letters of church at Philadelphia reminds us that it is not by the size or ability, but it is determined by the godly vision of an open door, coupled with faithfulness and courage and commitment. In our multi-ethnic ministry vision that God has given to us, I believe God has shown us to, uh, this open door. For example, we have many ethnic groups living in our neighborhood. If we do not see them, we do not, uh, our vision does not include them, then we, our door is very limited. It's not an open door. But we do. And we also have the, uh, the road construction site situated on our property for another year until the May of 2021. These are opportunities. These are open doors. Are we praying and willing to reach out to these people before the opportunity is gone? Given the current trends, the work of the Great Commission will be met with great opposition in the days ahead. But you know what? God will take care of the opposition forces against us because our Lord holds the keys to the open door. As church history shows, the gospel thrives the most when opposition was the strongest and greatest. May you and I act as wise witnesses and also we endure patiently our, our reward will be great in heaven. Folks, he who has the year, let him hear what the Spirit of God says to the churches. Now the final and seventh letter was addressed to the church at the Laodicea in Revelations chapter 3, verses 14 to 22. You see, the city of Laodicea was an important banking center. It has a medical school that developed a uh, a world-famous eye salve to strengthen the eyes. And it is famous for glossy black sheep in uh, the region that provides high-quality wool for clothing and for carpets. For all of the wealth and also the notoriety, however, the city has a major flaw. 
because the water from the springs they were laden with、uh, with lime, and it's undrinkable, not drinkable. Water therefore has to be piped from nearby cities such as Hier、uh, Hierapolis, a few miles north of the city. When the church at Laodicea started to be formed. In many ways, it kind of mirrored the conditions of the city. In this letter, Jesus Christ has no commendation to offer to this church. He describes himself in verse fourteen as the one who is the Amen, the faithful and true witness, and the ruler of God's creation. Now, the word Amen is a word of affirmation. Jesus said, "What I said is." Yes is yes, and no is no. While the church had been unfaithful and blinded about their spiritual status, Jesus Christ remained faithful and true. And He said, "I'm willing and I'm ready to restore you from your、uh, confusion and darkness, as I did in the first creation. I'm going to restore you. I'm because I'm the ruler of God's creation. And so Jesus Christ." Severely rebuked the church in verses sixteen and seventeen. First of all, the Laodicean church was pictured as utterly disgusting to Christ because of their lukewarmness and also spiritual、uh, in their spiritual lives. They were neither hot nor cold. Geographically, you know, the city uh, uh, was uh, has a、uh, it's a water source from a nearby city of. As I mentioned earlier, Hierapolis. It is known that Hierapolis is known for its hot medical springs. And there's another neighbor, the city of Colossae, or Colossae. It was known for for its cold and refreshing pure water. These are the sources of water that the、uh, the city of Laodicea draws from. Now, lukewarm water is useless for either purpose. So the church at Laodicea was kind of like that, in the searching eyes of Jesus Christ. That's how Jesus rebuked the church. Secondly, the Laodicean church also used a wrong standard of measurement. They measured the church church's spiritual health by their earthly health, by their wealth, and by their prosperity. And the church was so wretched and pitiful. She didn't even know that she was actually poor, blind, and naked in God's eyes. So Jesus Christ said, "I'm about to spit you out of my mouth." The church at Laodicea is typical of the secular church in the 21st century. Very, very much content with spiritual things, material things. They open for services, they read the scriptures, they pray. But there's really no spiritual fervor in it. And what is the remedy? Jesus was was not about to give it up. Jesus advised them in verses eighteen to twenty one. He said, "I want you to refocus on spiritual richness. Buy from me gold refined in a fire, so you can become rich. And I want you to wear white clothes." Symbolic of righteousness and righteous deeds. That is,、uh, you seek God's priority. And Jesus said, "I, I want you to put on your eyes, saw, for spiritual sight, so they can see things from a spiritual perspective." And Jesus Christ tenderly reminded the church this way. He said, "Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline." So, be er,、uh, be er,、uh, be earnest, and repent. Brothers and sisters, are you a lukewarm believer? Jesus will chastise you if you are, because he loves you. So let's be wise, repent, and get fired up. Now, finally, Jesus made a final plea to each believer, and he offers two great promises. The first one is. Founding verse twenty one, twenty and twenty, verse twenty here. He said, "Here I am. 
I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Some of you may have heard of this a very famous painting showing Jesus knocking on the door. This door, however, has no latch on the outside. For a person who hears the invitation, hears the knocking, he opens the door. Jesus said, I promise you, I will share intimate fellowship with you right now. Moreover, to each person who responds and overcomes, he said, I will give you the privilege to sit with me on my throne and share my glory for eternity. So, as we come to the end of the message here, let's consider especially the churches at Philadelphia and also at Laodicea. Two churches, two doors. One which Jesus Christ, he is the controller of, the, uh, uh, of, my, of his church so that the church can fulfill his great commission. The other, however, each believers, they choose whether to fellowship with Jesus Christ or not. They control that door. These two doors are closely related. If one chooses to stay in the state of lukewarmness, he will be disciplined. But if you earnestly opens the door of, of your heart for Jesus Christ to enter in and abide inside, Jesus will give you an open door. The late Dr. Adrian Rogers said this. He said, the church will glow and grow, or it will die and dry. And it, it will either evangelize or it will fossilize. It never stands still. Growth is possible even in the toughest times. Perhaps even more so now that we have the pandemic around us that causes so many to lose hope. Well, they will gain, regain the hope, provided that you and I bring the hope of the gospel to them. In this 21st century, the opportunity to spread the gospel is never greater. We have all kinds of means, uh, such as cell phones, podcast, email, Facebook, live stream. On top of that, we have the people from different nations, ethnic groups, and cultural backgrounds living in our and working uh, uh, around us. We can act like the church of, uh, of Laodicea, locking the door even to Jesus Christ, who desires to fellowship with us. Or we can be like the church at Philadelphia, taking full advantage of the open door and be empowered to get fired up for his kingdom purpose to share the good news. Jesus said, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Brothers and sisters, may the Lord help us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. And also to not only the church as a, as a whole, but also to each individual believers inside the church. Let us pray. Father, thank you for reminding us that you are walking among us today. And you know all our deeds, both as individuals and as a church. We acknowledge that we have failed you in many ways. In compromising our faith, for example, and practice, we do so often because of the hostile world around us. And we also are lackadaisical in pursuing you in our prayers and in our outreach. Father, may you convict us of our self-illusion, thinking that we are rich without being aware of the fact that we are poor in our relationship with you. May you forgive us and continue to draw us to you to yourself through the Holy Spirit. 
May each of us be ever ready to respond to your gentle knocking, and they open and that we will open our hearts to you, and invite you in not as a guest, but as the Lord of our lives. Lord Jesus, you have brought us, you have bought us with your life, and we will never be able to repay for what you have done, except that we can present ourselves. A living sacrifice for you to use. May you be pleased to enable us to do just that. And we pray in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Again, thank you so much for joining us for the live stream. And let's uh, uh, go to the announcements. First of all, starting this week, we're uh, doing a Two live stream services, one in Chinese at ten o'clock. The second one, as usual, at eleven o'clock in English. We're so happy that you join us, and we will ask you to invite your friends,、uh, whether they speak Chinese or English, to join us for live stream service,、uh, respectively. Secondly, don't forget the important time of. There is power in our、uh, corporate prayer service. When the early church prays in chapter four of the book of Acts, even they pray so much so even there is an earthquake shaking the, the the door, shaking the the city. Folks, let's gather together and pray. And finally, just to remind you, always check on your、uh, email or other devices. Of、uh, communication, to make sure that you are up to date with the church activities. Pray that the church will be able to open up for gathering and worship in the in the days to come. Pray for our children, especially, that we will be able to nurture them in God's ways, and nurture them,、uh, grant,、uh, share with them the Word of God faithfully. With that, let's bow our heads for God's benediction. Father, may you help us live each day, so that we will walk closely with you, that we will love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. May you show us that you have given us an open door. Motivate us to take this window of opportunity to reach many for Christ. Father, now may you bless us with your blessing. May you protect us from physical and spiritual harm. In the coming week, in the blessed name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. May your life be filled with joy, peace, and rest. Amen.
是我不知羞愧，隐藏我，保佑我，环绕我，引导我，我要一生至死跟随。山，恳求你的恩典遮盖我的罪，我为我过犯深感懊悔，我要向你承认我的罪与不义，向你夫妇下跪，我要现在。向你献上我的祷告，求你拯救我，使我不知羞愧，隐藏我，保佑我，环绕我，引导我，我要一生至死跟随。我要现在向你。献上我的祷告，求你拯救我，使我不知羞愧，隐藏我，保佑我，环绕我，引导我，我要一生至死跟随，隐藏我，保佑我。环绕我，引导我，我要一生。